Hey guys, this is Chris of The Ancient Scholar, and today what I'd like to do is just answer a quick question. This goes back to the crystal field theory uh, set of videos that I've done, and it's just kind of an answer, a question to help with the intuition as to uh, why we have uh, energy level uh, splitting and what goes on with the d orbitals. So if uh, you remember, when we talked about crystal field theory, um, we start off with uh, the five sets of d orbitals. So let's just say that I'm going to draw a little energy level diagram here with energy going up um, on the y-axis here. And um, let's just say that I start off with a, a naked um, uh, metal, uh, transition metal ion um, that is uh, without any any influence from ligands or any electrostatic influence that just have uh, a metal ion has d orbitals, and, and we can pretty much say that under those situations, the energy of the five d orbitals, okay, the energy is degenerate, and that is they're all basically at the same energy level. And then what happens is in crystal field theory and ligand field theory is I get a split of that energy level and I have two orbitals at a higher energy level and then three inner three orbitals at a lower energy level and of course we remember that the the difference in energy the delta is what uh, we use to determine uh, what the strength of the field and is it a, um, a, a high spin or a low spin situation um, is it a strong or weak field and uh, we talked about the ligands that can cause strong and weak fields. And so what I'd like to do today is I'd like to, I'd like to answer the question, well, why do I get this, this kind of splitting? And this, this splitting, of course, is specific to the uh, certain um, geometry, the octahedral um, geometry. And I talked about other geometries that can cause the orbitals to split in different ways. But we'll just kind of stick with the standard uh, case. This tends to be the most common case as well, where I have octahedral or I have six ligands that are uh, coordinating with the metal. So that's the question I want to answer today. So let's just uh, imagine, if we will, let me grab a new piece of paper here. Let's just imagine, just for this, the sake of, of, of learning, let's imagine that I'm going to have my energy level diagram here. And then I am going to draw an M, and that is going to be my metal. Okay, it can be whatever transition metal I want it to be, and it can be in, in pretty much whatever uh, oxidation state plus two plus three whatever. All right, plus N. We'll say M plus N. There we go. All right, and so we have five. Okay, the 5D orbitals here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to invoke a very special situation. And this is just going to kind of help with understanding what's going on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put this, this metal in, into, uh, maybe, maybe imagine like a, like a sphere. And this sphere contains an, a field. We can even maybe look at it as a negative, uh, negatively charged field. Um, and the charge is uniform throughout this entire field. It's a negatively charged field. Uh, now, such a situation, you know, doesn't really exist. But let's just imagine if we could place this metal ion into a field of negative charge, and the charge is all the same. So every part of this atom is experiencing the exact same charge. And what would happen? Well, um, there would be, because of the, the, the electrons that inhabit the um, d orbitals and um, the negative charge, there would be some repulsion, and that repulsion would shift the energy levels of the orbitals up. And what we would see is if it was evenly distributed, we would see the energy of all five of those d orbitals pop up, like so. But the orbitals would remain degenerate. Their energy would pop up, but they would still remain degenerate. So clearly, when we talk about splitting, when we have a splitting of energy, clearly it has something to do with maybe charge 
uh, maybe electrons interacting, maybe not everywhere, but maybe specific areas of the metal. And I think that's where the, a really good uh, key point comes from when we have when we have octahedral geometry. Okay, I have uh, my my metal. Okay, and imagine that this here is the Z or Z axis. Okay, and I have axes. This is moving out away. This is popping out. Um, all right, like so. You kind of have to use your imagination and imagine that we're talking. We're looking at this three dimensionally, and I'm going to make uh, this will be my Y axis. And this will be my x-axis, okay? My x and y-axis, and then my my z-axis. Now, when we talk about ligands coming in, the ligands are not like a field, like a uniform field. The ligands come in, and when we talk about six ligands, um, octahedral geometry, okay, our ligands are going to come in at the points, okay, along, right along the axes. So right along the z-axis, I'm going to have ligands coming in. Along the y-axis, ligands will come in. And right along the x-axis, okay. And then these ligands will come in lined up directly along these axes as they come in with their electron pairs. And they coordinate with the metal. So this is not a uniform situation. Rather, this is a situation where um, you know you can think of a ligand in a lot of cases as having a lone pair of an electrons, and it is moving in to coordinate with a metal that has a positive charge. And so those electrons that the charge is not spread out uniformly, but it's rather focused in one area, and it's focused along the axes. Well, that is actually really important because when we talk about, okay, when we talk about the d orbitals, let's just talk about what, what uh, d orbitals we have. Okay, so we have the z squared orbital, okay, we have the x squared minus y squared orbital, okay, we have the x, z, orbital, okay, we have the y, x, d orbital, and then um, finally we have the, uh, let's see here, we had the y, uh, x, z, y, z, oops, there we go, the y, z, and then the x, y, okay, so those are the five orbitals, z squared, x squared minus y squared, um, the xz, the yz, and the xy. Now, the interesting thing to know about the d orbitals is they definitely have a, a very specific orientation. And in, in particular, the two, orbital, the two orbitals that I want to talk about, I want to talk about the z squared orbital and the x squared minus y squared. And the way that these specific orbitals are, are aligned, the z squared orbital is aligned right along the z or z axis. And it may look something like this if I were to just draw the, the lobes and the areas of probability density. It may look something like this, the torus with the little lobes. And it is lined directly along the z axis. The um, x squared minus y squared axis has four little lobes that are aligned right along the y axis and the x axis, directly in line. Okay, now the x squared, or the um, xz, the yz, and the xy, those lobes are not aligned directly along the axes, but rather their lobes are in between the axes, okay? So, now that we've talked about kind of how the orbitals are aligned, specifically the x squared minus y squared and the z, the z squared 
um, orbital, hopefully it becomes pretty obvious what's going on is when I have ligands moving in, okay, and I have a ligand that moves in um, uh, talking about, uh, let's see here, octahedral geometry. So I've got my metal. All right. All right. And this is my Z axis. This is my X. And this is my Y. All right. So what happens is when those ligands come in, those ligands are coming in directly. Okay, here's a ligand here. It's coming in directly in line with the z-axis, and we know that what orbital, which of the d orbitals lies right along, aligns along the z-axis? Well, that is the um, z squared orbital. And then I also have ligands. When we talk about an octahedral geometry that are going to come in along the y-axis directly in line with the y-axis, okay, and I'm going to have ligands that are going to come in directly in line with the x-axis as well, okay. So these are aligned directly with the axes, and so when you look at the x and y axes, that is going to be the x squared minus y squared orbitals, uh, d orbitals, and the other orbitals the other d orbitals have probability density that's in between. It's line, aligned on planes in between these axes, so they are not interacting directly with um, the ligands as they come in. So what happens is when we get that splitting, okay, I'm going to try to leave this, this up here. What happens is when I get that splitting as the ligands come in, all right, so here's my energy. I'll start down here. All right, so what happens is, as I split, the ligands are directly in line with the x squared minus y squared and the z squared, so those orbitals are going to have increased energy. They're going to experience much more um, electrostatic repulsion than the other three orbitals, the x, z, y, z, and the x, y orbitals. And so they will be at a lower energy. So we have the z squared and the x squared minus y squared orbital here at higher energy. And then these three guys over here, the x, z, y, z, and x, y orbitals, lower energy. Now, if I have special situations where perhaps ligands um, are able to come in at off angles, okay, off from the main axes, the x, y, and z axes, then what's going to happen is these three orbitals may experience more electrostatic repulsion, and their energy levels may end up being higher than these two, and that's where we get those other types of, of geometries where you can have a flipping of the orbitals and other, other kinds of things happening. Um, but hopefully that makes sense why we have this typical um, three in two energy split, and it has to do with how the ligands are coming in and if the ligands are coming in right in, in line um, with a specific orbital, that orbital is going to experience electrostatic repulsion, and that is going to increase um, the energy level of that uh, when you look at energy level splitting. Okay, guys, I'm going to cut it off here. Hopefully you found that helpful and interesting. As always, thanks for hanging in there.